Hey guys, today I want to talk to you about resolutions and why they fail and what to do about it. You resolve to make a change for the better in your life. It could be any significant change, but let's say it involves getting on the path of mastery, developing a regular practice. You tell your friends about it. You put your resolutions in writing. You actually make the change. It works. You feel good. You're happy about it. Your friends are happy about it. Your life is better. And then you backslide. Why? Are you some kind of slob? Not necessarily. Backsliding is a universal experience. Every single one of us experiences significant um, resistance in changes, whether for the good or for the bad. No matter if it's for the worse or the better. Our body, brain and behavior have a built-in tendency to stay the same within rather narrow limits and to snap back when changed and that's a very good thing to do if your body temperature moved up or down by 10 percent you'd be in big trouble and the same thing applies to your blood sugar level and any other uh, levels in your body this condition of equilibrium this resistance to change is called homeostasis. It characterizes all self-regulating systems, from, from bacterium to a frog to a human individual to a family to an organization to an entire culture. And it applies to psychological states and behavior. The simplest example of homeostasis can be found in your own um, home heating system. The thermometer, the thermostat on the wall in the room senses the room temperature. Say when temperature uh, on a winter's day drops below the temperature that you've set, then the thermostat sends an electrical signal that turns the heater on. The heater completes the loop by sending heat through the room in which the thermostat is located. When the room temperature reaches the temperature you've set, the, st the thermostat sends another electrical, electro electro an electrical signal turning it off, thus maintaining homeostasis. So keeping the room at one temperature takes only one feedback loop. Keeping even the simplest single-celled organism alive takes thousands. And maintaining a human being in homeostasis takes Billions of interweaving electrochemical signals pulsing the brain, rushing along nerve fibers, coursing through the bloodstream. One example. Each of us has about 150,000 tiny thermostats in the form of nerve endings close to the surface of the skin that are sensitive to the loss of heat from our bodies. And another 16,000 or so a little, a little deeper under the skin that alert us to the entry of heat from without. An even more sensitive thermostat resides in the hypothalamus at the base of the brain, close to branch of the main artery that brings, that brings blood from the heart to the brain. This internal thermostat can pick up even the slightest changes from temperature in the blood. When your body starts getting cold, even a bit, these thermostat um, these, th these, these thermostats signal the sweat glands on your body, pores and small blood vessels near the surface of your skin to, to close down. Glandular activity and muscle tension cause you to shiver in order to produce more heat. And your senses send a very clear message to you, your brain, leading you to keep moving, to pull on more clothes, to cuddle closer to someone to seek shelter or even to build a fire. So homeostasis in social groups brings additional feedback loops into play. Families stay stable by means of instruction, exhortation, punishment, privileges, gifts, favors, signs of approval and of course affection. And even by means of extremely subtle body languages or facial expressions. Social groups larger than the family add various types of feedback systems. A, a national culture, for example, is held together 
by the legislative process, law enforcement, education, the popular arts, sports and games, economic rewards that uh, favor certain types of activity, complex, a complex map, a complex web of mores, prestige markets, a celebrity role modeling, and that relies largely on the media as a national nervous system. Although we might think our culture is mad for the new, the pr predominant function of this, as, uh, as in the feedback loops in your own body, is the survival of the things as they are. So the problem is homeostasis works to keep things as they are. So let's say for instance that for the last 20 years, ever since high school in fact, you've been almost entirely sedentary. You are fat! <laughs> Most of your friends are working out. And you figure that if you can't beat the fitness revolution, you'll join it. So, buying the tights and running shoes is fun. So are the first few steps as you, as you start jogging on the high school track near your house. Then, about a third of the way from the first lap, something terrible happens. Maybe you're suddenly sick to your stomach. Maybe you're dizzy. There's a strange panicky feeling in your chest. Maybe you're going to die. No, you're not going to die. What's more, the particular sensations you're feeling probably aren't significant in themselves. So what you're really getting is a homo homeostatic uh, alarm signal. Warning, warning. Significant changes in respiration, heart rate, metabolism. Whatever you're doing, stop it now. Immediately. Homeostasis doesn't distinguish what we would call, what we would call change for the better or the worse. It just feels change. And then the alarm bell kicks in. It resists all change. As for 20 years without exercise, your body considers the sedentary lifestyle as homeostasis, as the normal state. So the beginning of a change for the better is interpreted as a threat. So you walk slowly back to your car, figuring you'll look around for some other revolution to join. So take another case involving a family of five. The father happens to be an alcoholic who goes on a binge every six to eight weeks. During the time he's drinking and for several days afterwards, the family is in an uproar. It's nothing new, these periodic uproars have become the new state of normal, a state of homeostasis. Then, her, uh, for one reason or another, the father stops drinking alcohol. You would think that everyone in the family would be happy, and they are, for a while. But, homeostasis has strange ways, sneaky ways to strike back. There's a pretty good chance, within a very few months, some other family member Say, for instance, the son, a teenage son, will get caught in maybe dealing drugs to create just a type of uproar father's binge drinking previously triggered. So without wise professional counsel, the members of this family won't realize that the son unknowingly has simply taken the father's place to keep the family system in this condition that has become stable and normal. No need here to count the ways that organizations and cultures resist change and backslide when change does occur. Just let it be said that the resistance here, as in other cases, is proportionate to the size and speed of the change, not to whether the change is favorable or unfavorable one. If an organizational or cultural or cultural reform meets tremendous resistance, it is because it's either a tremendously good idea or a tremendously bad idea. Trivial change, bureaucratic meddling is easier to accept. And that's one reason why you see so much of it. In the same way, the more talkier forms uh, of, of psychotherapy are acceptable, at least to some degree. Perhaps because sometimes they change not very much. Accept the patient's ability to, ability to talk about his or her problems more, but none of this is meant to condemn homeostasis. We want our minds, bodies and organizations to hold together. 
We want that paycheck to arrive on schedule. In order to survive, we need stability. Still, change does occur. Individuals change. Families change. Organizations and entire cultures change. Even though the process might um, cause a certain kind of anxiety, maybe even pain or upset, the questions remain. How do you deal with homeostasis? How do you make change for the better easier? How do you make it last? These questions rise to the great importance when you embark on the journey of mastery. Say that after a, a number of years hacking around in your career, you start to approach it in the terms of you start to approach it in the terms of mastery using the principles. Your whole life obviously will change. And thus you have to deal with the change that comes with homeostasis. But, e but even if you should to begin uh, applying mastery to pursuits such as gardening or tennis, which might seem less than central to your existence, the effects of the change might ripple out and touch almost everything you do in life. Realizing significantly more of your potential can change you in many ways and however much you enjoy the change you most likely meet with homeostasis <laughs> sooner or later you might experience homo homeostatic alarm signals in the form of psychological symptoms you might even get a resistance from family friends or co-workers and you can consider yourself fortunate indeed when you, when you don't find yourself on that old familiar slide back that used to be the old you Ultimately, ultimately, you have to decide for yourself if you do want to um, spend the time and effort to stay on the path of mastery. If you do, I will give you five guidelines that might help staying on the path. While these five guidelines are focused on mastery, they could easily be applied to any other change uh, you want to make in your life. So, number one, here we go. Be aware of the way homeostasis works. This might be the most important guideline of all. Expect resistance and backlash. And realize that when the alarm bells start ringing, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're sick, crazy or lazy, or that you made a bad decision in embarking on the journey of mastering history. In fact, you might take these signals as an indication that your life is definitely changing for the good. Just what you wanted, of course, it might be that you just that you started that you have started something that's not right for you only you can decide but in any case don't panic and give up at the first sight of trouble as I mentioned before you might experience resistance from family friends and co-workers say for instance you used to struggle getting out of bed at 730 and direct yourself to the office at, at 9 now that you're on a part of mastery you're already up at 6 for a 3 mile run <laughs> and in the office charged with energy at 8.30. You might figure that your co-workers will be overjoyed, but don't be too sure. And when you get home, still very much energized, do you think that your family will welcome the change? Maybe, but bear in mind that an entire system has to change when any part of it changes. So don't be surprised if some of the people you love start covertly or overtly it's not that they wish you harm, it's just homeostasis at work. <laughs> Number two, be willing to negotiate with your resistance to change. So what should you do when you run into resistance? When the red light flash and the alarm bells ring, well, you don't back off and you don't bull your way through. Negotiation is the ticket to successful long-term change in everything. From increasing your running speed to transforming your organization. The long distance runner, for a faster time on a measured course, negotiates with homeostasis by using pain. Not as an adversary, but as the best possible guide to performance. The change-oriented manager keeps his or her staff eyes open for signs of dissatisf dissatisfaction or dislocation, then plays the edge of discontent, the inevitable escort of transformation. The fine art of playing the edge in this case involves a willingness to take one step back for every two steps forward, sometimes vice versa. 
It also demands a determination to keep pushing, but not without awareness. Simply turning off your awareness to the warnings deprives you of guidance and risk damaging the system. Simply pushing your way through, despite the warning signals, increases the possibility of backsliding. You can never be sure exactly where the resistance will pop up. A feeling of anxiety or psychosomatic complaints, even a tendency towards self-sabotage, squabbles with family, friends or fellow workers. In any case, stay alert and be prepared for serious negotiations. Number three, develop a support system. You can do it alone, but it helps a great deal to have other people with you whom you can share the joys and perils of the change with. The best support system would, would be people who have gone through or are are going through or gone through a similar process. People who can tell their own stories of change and listen to yours. People who will brace you up when you start to backslide and encourage you when you don't. The path of mastery, fortunately, almost always forces social groupings. Say for instance, tenancy, the tenancy with sports and games uh, in which a play community develops. The, the play community is likely to continue even when the play is done. Inspired by the feeling of being apart together is an exception is an exceptional situation of sharing something important, of mutual withdrawing from the rest of the world and rejecting the norms. The same thing can be said about other pursuits, whether or not they are known formerly as sports, arts and crafts like hunting, fishing, yoga, zen, uh, different professions or at the office. What if your quest for mastery is a lonely one? What if you can find no fellow voyagers on your particular path? At least you can let the people close to you know what you're doing and ask for their support. Number four, follow a regular practice. People embarking on any type of change can gain stability through practicing some worthwhile activity on a more on a more or less regular basis not so much for the sake of achieving a external goal but simply for its own sake a traveler on a path of mastery is again fortunate for practice in this sense as I've said more than once is the foundation of the path itself the circumstances are particularly happy in case you've already established a regular practice in something else, change of beginning a new one. It's way easier to start applying the learned principles of mastery to your profession or your primary relationship when you say for instance have already established a regular morning exercise program. Practice is a habit and any sort of practice provides a sort of underlying homeostasis and that's a good thing. So that forms a stable base during the instability of change. So number five, dedicate yourself to lifelong learning. We tend to forget that learning is much more than book learning. Education, whether it involves books, body or behavior, it is a process that changes the learner. It doesn't have to end at at college graduation or at age 40, 60 or even 80 and the best learning of all involves learning how to learn. That is a change. The lifelong learner is essentially the one who has learned to deal with homeostasis simply because he or she is doing it all the time. So and that's why lifelong learning is the special province of those who travel the path of mastery. The path that never ends. So that's it for today. If you think if you think um, this was of value to you, please subscribe and uh, give me a thumbs up. So everything that I just told you in this video is uh, from this book, Mastery, from George Leonard. I really recommend you to read this book. This book has tons of timeless value in it, like there is no time timestamp to what is in this book, so you can read it. Yeah, what am I trying to say here? I'm just trying to say that this is a really good book, and if you want to learn how to master something, if you want to know 
why people fail at mastering something, why resolutions fail, or I mean a quick quick example. In this book you'll discover the five essential keys to mastery. That's nice. Tools for mastery. Mastery and energy. How to master <laughs> how to master your athletic potential. Um, the three personality types that are obstacles to mastery. You have the the obsessive, the dabbler, and the hacker, and they go deep into the definition of what they mean. Usually, you are one of them. Uh, and how to avoid pitfalls along the path, and many more things. So, I recommend this book. It's awesome. Go buy it. If you want to buy the book, you can buy it anywhere you want, anywhere you like. You can buy it via the, the description link in um, via the link in the description. But if you buy it via that link, I get a percentage of the what you pay. So you pay the same. A bit of money goes to me. So why should you do that? I don't know. If you want to, you can do it. If you want to support me, I would like it. If you want to do it uh, at another website, that's also fine. Whatever you want, whatever you like.